Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is yet another devastating case that does involve a family murder. I have no idea why these cases have been popping up for me so often, but when I see them, I feel the need to cover them and discuss what's causing each horrible situation. But before we get into the case, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to Manta Sleep for partnering with me on today's video. Manta Sleep is on a mission to empower light sleepers like myself to sleep better so we can do more. Those of you who have been watching my channel for a while, or if you're a Patreon subscriber, you know that I am literally the world's lightest sleeper. I have struggled with sleep my entire life, and I'm constantly trying to find new ways to improve my sleep. I've never been able to nap during the day because no matter how dim I make my room, my room never gets dark enough, so I'm never able to fall asleep. But thanks to Manta Sleep's sleep mask, I'm finally able to get some good naps in. Naps deliver a number of benefits. Naps can be restorative and reduce fatigue during the day. After a night of insufficient sleep, which is something that I experience all the time, a nap can counteract daytime drowsiness, which again is huge for me. Some studies have shown that physical performance can also improve after napping. Athletes may improve endurance, reaction times, and cognitive performance if they take a daytime nap. That's a really important factor for me because I work out almost every day. I have a very physical job where I'm making decisions all day, every day. I work in healthcare and I work with children, so I really need to be on top of my game. And then on top of that, I do aerial circus. So there's all these little things that go into that that I really need to be on top of my game and I cannot forget anything or else I fall to the ground. So getting in naps and making sure I get quality sleep is so important for me. I have two of their sleep masks. I have the Manta Sleep Pro, which is a true 100% blackout for a deeper sleep. They have C-shaped eye cups that are so much more comfortable for side sleepers like myself. They also offer no pressure on your eyelids or eyelashes, which I find so much more comfortable than other sleep masks, which lay directly on your eyes and eyelashes. That is so uncomfortable. But because of Manta Sleep's breathable material, that doesn't happen anymore, and I can wear the mask all throughout the night or during naps. Then I also have the Manta Sleep Mask Glow. This is made with the same amazing materials and no pressure on the eyelids or lashes, but the glow makes it a lot easier to find in the dark. I can't even explain how often I put my light out and then get comfy in my bed and then I have to feel around everywhere in the dark because I forgot to grab my sleep mask already, but the glow mask has made that so much easier because I can spot it right away. They also have tons of other masks such as Sleep Mask Sound, a cooling mask, and a steam mask. The cooling mask for me seems like another one I want to give out a try because I do get hot at night like I said and I feel like it would feel so good during the night to have that cooling sensation on your face. So if you want to join Manta Sleep on their mission for better sleep, make sure you use my link down below and use my code RACHELS10 for 10% off today. Once again, that's using my link down below and use my code RACHELS10 for 10% off today. Thank you again so much to Manta Sleep for partnering with me on today's video. Okay, so with that being said, let's get into the case. Today, we are going to be discussing the Jacobson family murders. Neil Jacobson was born to his parents, Goldie and Harold Jacobson. Harold was an ex-Marine, and I believe Goldie was a stay-at-home mother, and Neil had a sister named Deborah. Growing up, Harold and Goldie raised their children in a strict but loving home. They were said to be great parents, but they did have issues of their own. Goldie suffered from depression pretty much Neil's entire life, having breakdowns every few years, but she never sought help for her issues. Harold suffered from anxiety, never wanting to leave his comfort zone. Those who knew the family said that Harold felt safe by Goldie's side and the two pretty much wouldn't go anywhere without the other. Then Neil seemed to have issues of his own as well. He was known for growing up to want to be the perfect child. He was often anxious and overwhelmed, trying to live up to the expectations that his parents had for him and that he had for himself. He was accepted to Montclair State University, but he dropped out just short of getting his bachelor's degree because the stress of the work was getting to be just too much for him. 
But even through all that, Neil always had his father to rely on. Harold was Neil's rock. Neil would go on to get married to a woman named Frankie Sulkoff. Frankie and Neil met in an apartment gym where they lived in Bayside, Queens, New York. He was 29 at the time, and she was 33 years old when they met. At the time, both of them were stockbrokers. He worked at a small firm in Long Island. Frankie, on the other hand, worked at Shearson Lehman Brothers on Wall Street. Those who knew the couple said that Frankie loved Neil with everything she had. People described Neil as being generous, happy, and sweet all of the time. He was generous and he was quick to help anybody with whatever they needed. Neil described that the two had the best relationship. They had been friends for quite some time before they started dating. They loved doing anything and everything together, from scuba diving, bicycling, and traveling. Soon after the couple started dating, Neil and Frankie moved from New York to New Jersey, which is where Neil was originally from. He started back working as a mortgage broker, which is what he had done before he moved to New York. The couple were engaged by New Year's Eve in 1989, and by July 29th of 1991, they were married. By 1993, Neil opened his own mortgage brokerage firm, and a few years after that, Frankie joined him to help operate the business. Those around them said that the couple worked really well together in their real estate endeavors. They were making good money and things were going amazingly. By 2002, the couple purchased their first home in Wayside, New Jersey. However, during that time, the couple knew that they wanted to have children. They had gone through multiple rounds of fertility treatments and time and time again, they were unable to conceive children like they had long dreamed. But through heartbreak after heartbreak, the couple finally had their dream come true. That same year, the couple went on to have a set of twin boys, Joshua and Eric. From there, the boys became Neil and Frankie's lives, as children pretty much always do, the children attended a Hebrew school, and there they flourished. Those who knew the family described that Eric was the more intellectual, serious one, whereas Josh was the more fun, playful type of kid. But the two seemed to be the perfect duo, doing everything together. The two boys excelled in sports, and they had tons of friends. At the same time, Frankie and her sister were working on a children's book, they published their first book, Green Bean's Birthday Party, in December of 2009. She had been working on learning and teaching sign language since Josh had a speech problem and communication was quite difficult for him. But even after having children, tons of money coming in, and a lavish house in the suburbs, Neil wasn't happy. He was sick of the weather in New Jersey, and he had been thinking about moving for quite a while. His parents had moved down to Florida a few years before that, and his father was starting to get sick, and he wasn't able to come visit them up north anymore. So finally, by the fall of 2003, Neil made the decision to buy some property down south in Florida. The couple put down a deposit on a 4,000 square foot pre-construction home in the Isles at Wellington. But when they first put this money down, Neil said that he sort of led his wife to believe that the home wouldn't be their permanent residence. She actually really did not want to move. So, by the time the construction was finished on the house, Frankie didn't even want to put furniture in it because she didn't want to be there. They would visit the house and stay there for vacation, but they would often just sleep on blow-up air mattresses because she didn't want to move there, so she didn't want to furnish the house. Neil continued his real estate endeavors over time, purchasing four condos, some in Lantana, Florida, that he said were investment properties. At the time, all of this seemed like a great idea. The rent money that they would get from these investment properties was going to make them money and outweigh the cost of buying them. Real estate was very fruitful at the time. It was booming. It was a great time to get involved, but it definitely didn't give the returns that he had hoped to get. After buying all of these properties, Neil desperately wanted to move to Florida, but Frankie still didn't want to. She liked New Jersey. It's where her friends were. It's where the children were going to school, and Joshua was getting therapy for his speech issues. But the financial strain just kept growing bigger and bigger on the family. By 2007, they tried selling their home in Wayside, but again, real estate just was not booming at the time. So they rented it out, and they headed south. 
They sold the mortgage business that they had started together, and by the 4th of July weekend in 2007, the Jacobsons arrived to Florida to settle there. But as they were going through this change, as a lot of us know, by 2008, the real estate bubble popped and a lot of people were in deep, deep trouble. Then to add to all of that stress after moving to Florida and all of these rental properties not making any money, Neil's father, Harold, passed away. Like I said earlier, Harold was Neil's rock. He was devastated after losing his father, so again, this stress was just piling and piling on. With the mortgage crisis of 2008, obviously the real estate market was just not a fruitful one, their business stalled, and they weren't really making any money through real estate. Then the rent money that was coming in from their rental properties was well below what they were estimated to get from the builders of the properties. Neil admitted that he was overzealous with the housing market when it was in boom and he made some bad purchases. He ended up being one of the many who took out a stated income loan this basically meant that he could write down a number to state his income and it wouldn't be verified. But it came at a very high interest rate and was very expensive, much more expensive than he originally thought. He was not able to pay back the $225,000 that he took out because he didn't have a stable income and he exaggerated how much he was making in order to get this loan, which again is something that a lot of people did because if it's not verified, you can pretty much write whatever you want. After the market crash in September of 2008, Neil decided that he had had enough. He stopped making payments on the three condos that they were renting out and let them go to default. They were done using up their savings to pay for these condos. The family went from having $2.2 million in cash and equities to being in $2.3 million in debt in just five years. At the same time, by the summer of 2008, Neil started to feel sick. He was feeling fatigued all of the time. He had body aches and he just was not feeling good. So he went to the doctor and that fall, he was diagnosed with elevated thyroid stimulating hormone levels, which basically means that he had high thyroid numbers. But the numbers weren't so high that the doctor thought that it was appropriate to treat it with medication yet. He was just 0.2 above the normal, so his doctor said to give it six months and then come back for more testing. But over the course of the next few months, the symptoms got worse. He gained weight. He was feeling very dizzy. He became even more lethargic as time went on. So once again, by January 2nd, 2010, he went to the doctor. But this time he went to a different doctor. And Neil didn't know that his symptoms could be related to his hormone imbalances. So I don't know if it wasn't mentioned or if it was mentioned and the doctor didn't think that it was a problem because he had been pretty much normal before. So this other doctor did not order any blood work. Instead, Neil was diagnosed with depression and transient peripheral vertigo. This peripheral vertigo does cause symptoms of dizziness and feeling faint and nauseated. However, there are very specific tests that we can do to identify if someone has these inner ear issues, but from the training that I've received, it's not something that's easy to misdiagnose. A lot of the symptoms and signs that you get from these tests are pretty obvious signs, so it's pretty easy to diagnose these things. So I don't know how he was diagnosed with this, but that's what he was. But either way, because of this diagnosis, Neil was prescribed Zoloft, an SSRI antidepressant. SSRI means Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. This is a very common type of antidepressant that is prescribed, and as many as 13% of Americans aged 18 years or older take SSRIs. He was instructed to take 50 milligrams once per day of Zoloft. SSRIs are used to help prevent the reuptake of serotonin, basically making it so that there's more serotonin floating around in your brain, which basically is the neurotransmitter that makes you feel happy and more content. Then in a second visit, the doctor prescribed Neil Xanax, which is a benzodiazepine. For this, he was told originally to take 0.25 milligrams per day. Benzos are a depressant of the central nervous system meant to calm down people when they have a panic or anxiety disorder. With those medications, he was given a list of psychiatrists to start seeing for his ongoing care, and he did. He made an appointment, and two days after the doctor visit, he visited his new psychiatrist. 
According to Neil, during that first appointment, he was shaking, he was nervous, and he told the doctor about his reoccurring panic attacks, about the crash of the market, and about how he was suffering from severe insomnia. But in his report, the doctor, Dr. Pierre Andre, wrote that Neil was clean, fully oriented, coherent, not suicidal, not homicidal, and had no psychotic symptoms. But after the visit, Dr. Andre diagnosed Neil with major depression and anxiety disorder. He renewed his Zoloft prescription and upped his Xanax prescription to one milligram per day. But it seemed to those around Neil that his new prescription medications were just making things worse for Neil. Frankie told Neil's sister, Deborah, that Neil was keeping her up at night. He was tossing and turning and getting up and down. There was even one night where she found him sleeping face down on the floor, and she thought that he had even died at that point. Neil's depression only got worse, and so did his anxiety and paranoia. Deborah described that Neil started hallucinating. He wasn't sleeping. Whenever he laid down to get rest, he would start hallucinating. He stopped wanting to leave the house. He stopped wanting to take showers or even take care of himself. He couldn't take care of himself or his children. He would take his Xanax at around 8 p.m., sleep for about two hours, and then would just pace around the house for hours, waiting for Frankie to wake up so that he could talk to her. Then, when she was up, he would talk and talk and talk endlessly. He would follow her around for the entire day, and if she did leave the house and if he did go with her, he would almost cower behind her and would refuse to talk to anybody or make eye contact with anybody else. Then his hallucinations got worse. He started to say that he felt like Frankie was towering over him, that she was 10 feet tall. He said that he was worried that the FBI was monitoring him and gathering surveillance and evidence against him. He was so worried about how he overstated his income on that stated income loan that he thought that the FBI was going to come in and drag him away in handcuffs and that his children would be sent away to an orphanage. He was convinced that the feds were going to show up to the children's birthday party on January 23rd, 2010. A few days before the incident, Goldie, Neil's mother, went over to their home for a visit. During this visit, Neil was telling his mother that he loved her over and over and over again. He kept hugging her and telling her that if anything happened, that he loved her no matter what. Then, by the 22nd, Frankie started begging Neil to come to the gym with her. She thought that maybe exercising would help him feel better. So, he did. He went to the gym and he sat on a stationary bike. But even before he started pedaling, he said that his heart rate was 199 beats per minute. That is extraordinarily fast for someone at rest, especially somebody at his age. So that shows just how much anxiety he was feeling and how paranoid he was at that time. By the morning of January 23rd, 2010, it was time for the twins' birthday party. They were going to have their party at the Fun Depot in Lake Worth. However, the boys would never make it to their seventh birthday parties. That same morning, 911 received calls from a witness who reported that they spotted a 2002 silver GMC Envoy stopped in a ditch on the side of the road near the intersection of US 144 and West Atlantic Avenue. The witness said that there was someone slumped at the wheel and this person was not responsive. So, Palm Beach County Fire and Rescue responded to the call, and they found Neil Jacobson in the car, slumped over at the steering wheel. When he woke up, he was disoriented, asking officers where his gun was. Officers told him that they took it from the car, but he continued looking around and trying to grab for the gun. It was at this point that Neil told the officers that he had just killed his family. So, Neil was placed in handcuffs by these officers and they took him to the ER. In his room while receiving treatment by 2.40 p.m., Neil was interviewed. He was still very dazed and struggling to put together a thought. He had slurred speech throughout the interview, which lasted about two hours and eight minutes. He repeatedly admitted that he had killed his family, but he kept saying that he loved his family and he could not live with the thought that his wife or children were going to pay for his crimes. 
In that interview, he said, quote, the guilt just got to me. It got a mess. It just got a mess. I almost had no choice. I felt that the authorities were closing in on me. He continued by saying, I've never done anything like this before in my life. I've never hurt anybody. Something snapped. I was in a position where I literally had no choice. So of course, after hearing from Neil that he just murdered his family, the investigation began. What I'm about to tell you is from what Neil would later go on to say happened as he murdered his children and his wife. On the morning of January 23rd, 2010, 49-year-old Neil woke up and climbed out of his bed at around 6 a.m. that morning. This woke up his wife of 19 years, Frankie. She watched, still groggy, as Neil walked over to their closet and stepped inside. She then asked him what he was doing inside of the closet. While in the closet, Neil reached for the top shelf where he stashed a loaded 38 caliber handgun. He then stepped out of the closet and pointed the gun at Frankie. He said, honey, it's over. It's just over. There's no other way. He started walking towards Frankie, who was now wide awake and begging for her life. She repeatedly said that she doesn't want to die. And she asked, what about the boys? But to that, Neil responded, Frankie, we all have to go. That is when Frankie jumped out of bed and reached for the gun, and a struggle ensued. Both of them fell to the floor, and in that struggle, Frankie's front tooth was knocked out and her index finger was sliced open. Then Neil managed to point the gun at Frankie, and he shot her two times in the face. Then, after shooting and killing his wife, he reloaded his gun with the ammunition that he had placed in his pocket. He then walked to Eric's room first, where he was still asleep in his bed. Neil shot him two times in the face, but he didn't die immediately. So he walked over to his son, put a pillow over his face, and shot him twice more. Then he reloaded the gun and walked into the next room, Joshua's room. Neil put a pillow over Joshua's right cheek and shot him twice in the face. Then he turned around, walking past the boys' room and past the body of Frankie, and washed the blood off of his hands. Then he grabbed the keys to his 2002 GMC Envoy. Then he said that he went back into the children's rooms. He said that he started trying to shake the boys awake, saying, come on, hurry, get up. If you don't get up, I'm going to leave without you. So, because his two dead children were not waking up, he left. He walked outside and took several old Vicodin pills that he had, as well as the rest of the Zoloft and Xanax that he had in the bottles that he had been prescribed. So he took all of them. As he was telling police this story, he kept referring to a five-page suicide letter that he had written. There was one copy found in the closet. In that closet, there was a box full of bullets and then this suicide letter, which was typed and spelled out his financial collapse. His reasons for wanting to kill them was to prevent his family from facing the consequences of his bad financial decisions. This letter that was found in the closet was dated three days before the murders. After the police heard this heinous story, they went ahead and searched Neil's car. That is when they found the key to Goldie, Neil's mother's house. It turned out that after killing his wife and children, he grabbed the keys to his mother's house and started heading in that direction before he must have passed out from all of the drugs that he took and ended up in that ditch. Then in the car, they also found another copy of the typed suicide note that he wrote. There was blood on this copy and this one was dated for that same day. January 23rd. He gave varying reasons for why he was planning on visiting his mother, with the police fearing that maybe he was going there to harm her too, but Goldie does not believe that he ever intended on killing her. But who knows? He didn't intend on killing his family either. In the days and weeks after the murders, Neil continued to explain the crime and his thought process. He said that before he slipped into this deep depression, he was happy. He loved his life. He loved his family. But when he sought help, all the drugs did was cause a storm in his brain. He blamed the drugs for causing a disconnect between his thoughts and reality. He said that on the morning of the murders, he was talking in a very slow, deep voice. He said it was almost satanic-like. He said, quote, 
I remember that distinctly. It was not my voice. It was not my mannerisms. I'm not saying that I was possessed. I don't believe in that. What I am saying is that the medication did something to me. The Zoloft. I felt like my brain was literally on fire. Like, it felt like it was so hot. So, of course, after learning his entire history and hearing from the interviews and the details of everything, he was given a psychiatric evaluation at the jail that he was being held at. The psychiatrist, Dr. Montes de Oca, said that it is a very common side effect of taking SSRIs is feeling flat, emotionless, and blunted. The doctor who evaluated Neil said that he appeared emotionally blunted and flat. He showed no emotion at first. But as he was weaned off of his medication, about five weeks after the murders, his doctor said that he became hysterical. He was emotional, devastated, and he felt a lot of remorse for what he did. He asked repeatedly, how could I have done this? Dr. Monte de Oca also talked about how his original symptoms weren't even pure anxiety or depression. He said that the real diagnosis was hypothyroidism. He said, quote, Sometimes hypothyroid can cause you to not think rationally and you act in a totally inappropriate way because you cannot cognitively function properly. It's like a psychotic state. He was delusional. That's why he was exaggerating the anxiety. You have that medical condition, anxiety, and then throwing on benzos? I said, oh my god. Then as he was awaiting in jail, he was once again diagnosed with major depression and this time he was prescribed a different SSRI, Celexa. When he first started this new medication, he seemed to improve. He was cooperative, logical, coherent, and expressed appropriate emotions. But after a few weeks on it, once again, he became withdrawn, anxious, and emotionally blunted. His doctor requested that he stop these meds since clearly he had a bad response to SSRIs. Dr. Montes de Oca thinks that the doctors who prescribed the Zoloft and Xanax in the first place should have diagnosed and treated him with hypothyroid first rather than just pushing heavily psychotropic drugs. Other doctors have weighed in on the case, saying that it was incredibly reckless for an urgent care to prescribe Zoloft and Xanax, saying that urgent cares aren't even supposed to. Those drugs should only be prescribed by a psychiatrist after a comprehensive examination. They blame the multiple doctors who failed to screen him for hypothyroidism. They talked about how Xanax does particularly bad in people with depression. Specialists in neuroscience say that Xanax can cause someone to act in ways that they normally wouldn't if paired with depression. They said that a 50 milligram prescription of Zoloft is like the lowest that you can get and that's typically what you prescribe at first. They said that especially in someone with hypothyroid, a 50 milligram prescription of Zoloft can metabolize as if he's given 200 to 300 milligrams because hypothyroidism slows the metabolism. Either way, as a result of the brutality of this crime, the state prosecutor charged him with capital murder and he was seeking the death penalty. But many people came out to support Neil. Many people said that Neil was not a violent man. He had no prior criminal history of any kind. He was never violent towards anybody. Those who knew him said that he may have been an anxious person. He was very concerned with his economic status and having money and the perfect life, but he wasn't violent. But the prosecution disagreed. The big thing that they pointed out was the fact that he had two copies of the suicide letter, one dated three days before the murders and one dating the same day. This, to the prosecution, shows premeditation. Others also agreed with the prosecution, such as Frankie's sisters. They said that Neil was a coward, a fool, a fake. They called him a cruel man who let the devil take over and kill the family that loved him as a way to escape money troubles and his deepening debts. But Neil later explained that this wasn't premeditation. What happened was that when he originally planned it, he changed his mind. Until the day of the murders, he said that he woke up with urgency. He said, quote, it wasn't a plan. It was more of a mental urgency that something had to occur. I would wake up in the morning and I would go and have these thoughts. We gotta go. We gotta go. We've gotta leave. We gotta go. It was early morning agitation and as the days wore on, the thoughts would disappear. Until the day of the 23rd, when the thoughts would not disappear. He continued, quote, 
I woke up early that morning and I remember I'm in the closet and I'm kind of sitting on the floor and hearing voices. You gotta go. Now is the time. You gotta go. And these voices just became louder and louder and more intense. Because remember, he was convinced that the FBI was going to take him away and arrest him on the day of the twins' birthday party. So that might be why it seemed to be more intense urgency on this day. In light of being charged with murder and the prosecution seeking death, he decided to hire an expert psychologist to see if he could be considered mentally insane. And after the course of seven visits, he was diagnosed with bipolar type 2 with psychotic features, delusional disorder, personality disorder, and anxiety disorder with obsessive compulsive features. They determined that he was, in fact, legally insane at the time of the murders. But the prosecution said that in those suicide letters, he wrote that he knew what he was going to do, kill his wife and kids with a gun. He knew that his actions were beyond forgiveness. He wrote that letter before the murders took place. Therefore, there was planning. This was enough for Neil to decide that a jury probably wasn't going to go with the insanity defense. So, rather than going to trial, he pled guilty to three counts of first-degree murder. For this, he was given three life sentences without the possibility of parole. After this, he is now serving the rest of his life in prison. He works as a certified law clerk in the prison library, helping other inmates to navigate the legal system. He is involved in the veterans program due to his father having been in the military. He said that he cries and cries and cries in his cell and he regrets what he did every day. He said that he didn't even care if he got the death penalty because if he died, then he wouldn't have to live with the guilt that he faces every day, even though he did choose not to go to trial because of the death penalty, so that doesn't really make sense. But either way, he said that jail is where he deserves to be, but that the pharmaceutical companies also bear some blame. He accepts responsibility, but he still blames his actions on the medication. Now, the only medications he takes is one for controlling his thyroid. Others have said that they regret not acting on the warning signs. Friends and family of Neil said that they noticed him withdrawing. They noticed him isolating himself. They noticed him fall into a depression and they wonder if they could have just gotten him help, maybe they could have prevented this. But that is where the case sits today. It's a tough case to discuss and I feel like I've been covering a lot of these types of cases recently. To me, it's just what I'm seeing. I keep seeing these cases popping up and every time I look into them, I feel the need to discuss them. These parents that just kill their children and always have these different reasons for doing so and so many people in their lives feeling like they could have prevented it but not knowing exactly how. I do feel for Neil. It's not even a question that he got himself into a very deep financial hole. He put his family in debt. He was sinking deeper and deeper the longer time went on. And I do agree that doctors these days are far too quick to prescribe psychoactive medications. I myself have been prescribed SSRIs for symptoms when I specifically asked not to be prescribed anything because I do not respond well to those types of medications. I don't like how they make me feel and I don't want to take them. But even so, I've had doctors still trying to push this medication. I think it's very irresponsible how often medications like this are prescribed. It's the same thing with opioids, how they're used for anything from tooth pain to a broken ankle, and people develop dependencies based on how they are prescribed, which leads to other addictions. I personally work in an area of healthcare where we focus on the whole person, treating their symptoms and improving their quality of life without medication. In my opinion, and I'm I mean, I'm, I am in this area of healthcare, but it is my opinion that that should come first. Treating without medication should always come first and doing whatever you can to avoid overprescribing, that should come first. Because while there are a lot of people who greatly benefit from medication, there are tons who suffer even more because of the medications that they're put on. There are so many people with underlying health conditions that are missed and just passed off as mental health issues as we see here. There are so many things that can contribute to mental health problems because of hormones, trauma, lifestyle, and so many other things beyond brain chemistry that need to be treated alongside the mental issue itself. 
Because again, these medications, SSRIs, are only targeting your brain chemistry. They're not targeting the other things that are going on. And not everybody needs that. In fact, I think a small percentage of people who have these issues actually have to have a change in their brain chemistry. There are people who need that change after going through trauma temporarily and then can wean themselves off of it when they're starting to heal. There are people who need it lifelong. I understand that, but not everybody does. Not everybody with depression or anxiety needs to have their brain chemistry changed or supplemented. Some people need other things. Some people need other treatment methods. And that is what I'm saying here. People need to know their options because some people just jump to medication and it's because that's all they know. A lot of people think that depression equals meds, that I'm depressed, I need to take something. I'm anxious, I need to take something because that's what people know. That's what they're prescribed. That's what they're told. So that's what they think is going to help them. And when it doesn't, they have no idea what to think because they think, I don't know if it's the medication making me feel this way. I don't know if I just feel this way. I don't know if it's my fault. I don't know what's going on. And a good doctor will recognize that and change what's happening. A bad doctor will not. But with all of that being said, I am glad that Neil has accepted responsibility for what he did. I'm happy he's in jail. I'm happy that he wakes up every single day knowing what he did, what he took away from himself, his family, and the world. I'm glad that he lives in misery every single day because whether or not he was wronged by predatory lenders who gave out loans that they knew would default, that's a whole nother conversation for another day, or the doctors who overprescribe, or anybody else in his life who wronged him, at the end of the day, he killed his family. He killed his two seven-year-old children and he killed his wife of almost 20 years. He did that. Not the doctors, not the mortgage lenders. He did. Lots of people have horrendous reactions to medications and don't kill anybody. He could have sought help when he was experiencing these horrible things. He himself said that he knew he needed to get help, but he didn't because he was embarrassed. So he could have gotten help. You know what's more embarrassing is ending up in jail. So get help if you need it. It's just so sad how this and so many other cases like this turn out. It's devastating. And while I am empathetic to Neil's situation, I am grateful that he has accepted responsibility unlike so many other killers. I'm also happy that he is in prison for the rest of his life. But now I want to know what you all think. Do you think the meds truly are to blame? Do you think that this was planned because he was way too far into debt and he didn't want his family to find out? Or do you think he truly felt guilty and he just thought that he was going to be arrested? Do you think that there was more going on that just hasn't been brought to light? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. But either way, if you did like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and fill out the Google form that I have listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.